Hi, and welcome to the Macro Show. We talk macro, and you wonder, are bonds set for a massive short squeeze? Well, I think if there's any answer, this is the one you're looking for. We've got that. We've got CTA and quant positioning, uh, economic data, a lot of good stuff in there. The unemployment data, cred data, it's Friday after all. Let's get right into our headline story because the setup for a massive short squeeze in bonds is huge. Let me show you this chart to, that came out today uh, from IHS Market Limited and Bloomberg. It said traders are shorting one fourth, one fourth of TLT's outstanding shares. Now keep in mind, TLT is the iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. It's the largest traded US treasury bond ETF on the market and 25% of its shares are short. Looking back, the last time you saw anywhere near this was 2017. Now, what I what I want you to look at is pretty much all of 2021, except for this, you know, brief dip, it's been on an upward trend. So let's take a look at actual 30 year treasury yields and see what we can learn from this. Because you know you have to go back here to 2021 and you see short, 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 short. Now mind you, they're still shorting as if this thing should be still going up. But what's happening here is you can see what looks like a topping pattern. Now why is this occurring despite an increase in short interest? Well, simple, because the bond market already knows the story of inflation is transitory. It understands the base effects. It knows they're going away perhaps as early as May, and if not, then in June. And it knows that story is gone. And so what is the bond market telling you? Hey, this inflation thing isn't gonna happen the way you think. And so all of a sudden you see yields peaking. You've got a left shoulder ahead, potential right shoulder here. You've got uh, 30 year yields under the 30, uh, the 50 day moving average uh, where it closed today. And how about TLT, right? Same story, because what are 30 year yields? Nearly the exact opposite of TLT's price because bonds and yields trade inversely. And what do you see? Again, a bottoming pattern here. And if there was going to be inflation, the bond market certainly wouldn't be doing this. So buyers are coming in here saying, look, we know there's a massive short interest. We know that the this inflation story is about to go away and we're getting in on it early. Now to add to this story, because what's gonna happen is you're gonna see all these shorts at some point as bond prices rally, and where do they need to rally from? Well, if you look at TLT, you need to get eh, probably somewhere between over 140 to 142 before you're really gonna see prices move up. And we'll cover more of this on the Sunday chart show, and what's gonna happen? Those shorts are going to get squeezed out. They do not think bond prices can rise. Now, if we look at yields, if you prefer to look at yields, you're looking somewhere you know, in the 2.2 to low or high 2.2, 0.1% range for a breakout there and then a move lower. Now let's take a look at that quant positioning because there's because this is where it gets really interesting is you see a squeeze that could start with just with TLT alone. And keep in mind, back in 2017, you didn't have this, you know, brief burst of inflation due to base effects from the economy shutting down. You didn't have Fed doing QE. You didn't have any of that stuff. You didn't have you know, 16 million, 17 million people on employment. You didn't have any of that. So the situation is really ripe for a big short squeeze. And now let's take a look at the CTA or quant positioning. Now, what's interesting about this is I don't get this data unless it comes out publicly. And this is from Nomura. They are one of many uh, different uh, uh, dealer banks that run CTAs. And these are just automated computer programs. So they, they trade on based on price level. So they have a program that says when price hits a certain level, either buy or sell. Or, and if it can go max buy and beyond a normal buy and take a leverage and it can go to a max short or a very deep short position. Now, I happen to have access to TD Ameritrade's data because I'm an institutional advisor there. Fortunately, I can't share that. But what I can tell you is this data from Numera is not much different. And you can only imagine the people who coded this original one probably sold this concept to a bunch of different investment banks and just tweaked a little bit of, a, of buy and sell levels. And these machines hold a ton of money. And so what you can see is a short squeeze that begins with TLT it's going to morph into actually driving rates potentially on the long end near zero as it squeezes everybody out. Let me show you uh, this chart. Now, if you want to get this, you have to be a Macro Voices subscriber. How do you do that? You go to macrovoices.com and subscribe to that, and you can access the, this week's and other shows, not to mention all the chart data. So let's take a look at how you read these. 
And what you see down here is bonds. I'm not going to worry about the equity business. These things are max long on stocks already. So if you're buying stocks, you're already buying after the machines have bought. What you want to do is buy something the machines are short because you want to buy before they buy. That's the idea. So where you see this non level to buy means we're not going to buy anymore. There's no more to buy and level to sell. You see down here where you see this, the green 100s, these are max long. See these red minus 100. These are max shorts. U.S. Treasury 10 year non right. No more selling can happen here. And you can see that they're short nearly almost every government bond across the board, except for France and Italy. And I'm guessing this must uh, potentially Spain here. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, look at US, the U.S. 10 year. It, it has a level to buy at 137.11. Now, why does that matter? Well, let's go back to those charts and say, well, what's this 137.11? Well, you have to go to 10 year treasury bond or treasury note futures here you see 10-year treasury note futures and we're currently trading at 132.09 now remember the price to buy 137.11 well where is that well 137.11 was last seen in late january so what does that tell you well it look yep it looks like late january would be the number so what's going to happen is you see there's a short squeeze building up here thanks to everyone shorting tlt price starts to break out and get and move up what then happens is these machines now remember they are max short so they're in a short position meaning that they're going to start to reverse their shorts they're not even going long at that point they're just going to start unwinding their shorts and to do that they become net buyers well what's going to happen next is they're going to start buying in around this 137 level somewhere in here of the data i know you're going to see these machines start to buy and because there's enough of them at enough different primary dealer banks and they command a large amount of money you can see the buying or the unshorting of one will roll into the unshorting of another and so on and so forth until they become buyers now keep in mind you have to go back to August of 2020 to find out where they were last max long. And then over time, they started unwinding those long positions until they went into max short somewhere right in here. So now keep in mind, look at this big picture. We'll zoom out to the two year. This is the level they start to unwind their shorts. That's at 137.11. The peak, the all-time high is at 140. So imagine you start getting this domino effect of these massive machines that are just trading price levels start unwinding their shorts triggering each other to unwind their shorts and then to go to neutral and then to go long what are they going to do they're going to drag a massive amount of other money with them so you're going to see hedge funds and dealers you're going to see you know vol control strategies you're going to see other momentum strategies that are going to say hey momentum shifting and going up we better start buying so, you know, one of the, and that's going to actually turn into a bigger mess because nobody's expecting bonds to rally or interest rates to fall. And remember what happens when interest rates fall? What does that mean to the economy? Do you remember? It means financial conditions are tightening. It means all this stuff the Fed's doing is not working, at, which we already know that to begin with, but that's what it tells you. And it gets really interesting because you see all this short squeeze, you see this bottom, and you can tell that people are buying. Big pockets are buying. Big buyers are in here. Now, what does this all mean if you're watching yields, if you don't want to watch that? It tells you that the CTAs start unwinding their shorts here at about 1.8% uh, on the 30 year. And you can all imagine that's just going to catapult this thing lower and then deeper into potentially all time lows, perhaps all the way down to zero. And now you've got your story of how bonds are set for not only massive short squeeze, but a move down to zero percent, perhaps even on the long end of the curve, like we think is going to happen. It gets really interesting real quick. All right, let's get back to the data. And uh, again, you can check out the rest. It's pretty interesting. Uh, let's go on back to the Thursday day. Let's go to Spain for a while. We got CPI there on a preliminary basis. When you see the P, that's preliminary. And inflation went from 1.3 to 2.2. So definitely uh, there's some increase in inflation in Spain. Obviously, there's going to be some base effects there. Are they the same as we saw in the U.S.? Uh, the same percentage? I don't know. I'm guessing they're not. How about producer prices? These are prices coming into the factory in Italy went from 0.7% to 2.2% year over year. Again, there's gonna be base effects here, but still that's a big increase. Now let's move on to Germany. We've got the CPI there, 1.7 to 2.0 on a preliminary basis. Not such a big increase. I mean, it's 
0.3%, not huge, but it's still an increase. The question is, is this rate of change slowing? And yeah, I think it actually is. Let's take a look at the jobless numbers out of the U.S. Uh, they, they slowed down to 553,000 initial claims. But if this is where it's bottoming, we have serious problems because you want to see this bottom around, I don't know, under 200,000. What you want to see is people getting back to work and keeping their job. Now, I don't know if some of this is because people are going back to work and schools aren't opening, so they're going back on unemployment. I mean, those are factors as well. But what you want to see is people going back to work and keeping their job. And that tells you the economy and there's demand there. But what we're still seeing at these elevated numbers of 553, it's just too high. The normal in a normal healthy economy, you're going to run two to three hundred thousand a week, and what does that put total claims at? Sixteen point six million, down eight hundred and forty six thousand from the prior week. Still a good drop, but still sixteen point six million. Yeah, you know, and think back to the Fed. Now, what did Powell say about tightening monetary policy? You know, everyone's worried about it. And he said, "Look, not until the labor market's back." And his number was eight point four million. But that 8.4 million doesn't count all the people along the way that should have been getting jobs that didn't get jobs, right? New brand new entrants to the workforce. Maybe they graduated high school or college and hey, I'm ready to work and there are no jobs. So the real number is like 11, maybe 12 million, somewhere in there. So what does that tell you about when the Fed is going to actually tighten monetary policy? Not for a long time. That's what it tells you. Now, historically, it is what Powell said correct. As a Fed chair, yeah, that is absolutely correct. They tend to not tighten uh, monetary policy until everybody's back to work because that's where you really see inflation is when people are back to work. It tells you they're not tightening anytime soon. Not anytime soon at all. All right, let's get back to the economic data here. We got pending home sales uh, up 1.9% in March. It'll be interesting to see uh, that, of course, it missed expectations of 5% print. Are we starting to see a slowdown now in housing because of lack of supply? Maybe prices too high? It'll be really interesting to see how the housing market uh, keeps going because, you know, people talk about a bubble. And you understand a bubble doesn't have to be prices are just too high. That I mean, obviously, that is what a bubble is. But when you're in a dollar shortage, which is created by QE, and you're in this liquidity trap, you're going to see there's just too much debt. Let me show you. There's just too much debt. Check this out. Here's U.S. mortgage equity withdrawal, right? Second highest level in history. People are yanking money out of their house. Now, are they out buying, you know, RVs maybe and jet skis and vacations and all that? Possibly. Or maybe they're pulling equity out and they're nervous. Maybe they're paying down some of their high interest debt and they, maybe they're putting cash in the bank to say, look, I don't know if I'm getting my job back or if I'm going to get my job back at the former wage or in, I, I'm uncertain. So they're pulling cash while they can. Now, one thing to understand here is bubbles can, can burst in two different ways. One, you can just get a bubble that's just way out of line. Prices are way too high. There isn't demand there and they pop, right? That's a great financial crisis in a sense is what we believe. But really, what was the great financial crisis all about? Was it just overinflated prices? It was about the fact that people couldn't pay on their de on their bills, right? They couldn't make their mortgage payments because those uh, not not fixed rate but variable rate loans ratcheted up, and people didn't have the cash flow to pay them. That was kind of the idea. Well, what happens if we're in a dollar shortage, and the number of dollars are getting trapped in the financial system due to the liquidity trap, and people can't pay on all this debt, and you're just seeing they're taking out massive amounts of debt. Well, bubbles can pop that way too. You don't have to have inflated prices, although I think prices are inflated, but you don't have to have that. How about this four week bill auction at zero? Did it actually print at zero? The answer is yes. What is that telling you? There's a man for pristine collateral. We've talked about this. Banks are desperate need for pristine collateral. They're willing to obviously pay 0% to get it. Can interest rates, can bill auctions go, uh, bill, bill rates go negative? Yes, they've gone negative before. Certainly can. Again, how about more CBI data? Let's go over to Tokyo. Went from a def deflationary minus 0.2% to minus 0.6% in April. How about the core, excluding food and energy? Still deflationary, minus 0.2. And everyone says, hey, we're going to see inflation here because we're doing QE and stimulus and infrastructure. What do you think Japan's been doing for decades? They pioneered this. They, they, they plowed the path. We're just following down that path. And everyone thinks we're getting inflation when they can't? Mm, no. 
Let's, how about the manufacturing PMI Japan? 53.6. Remember, over 50 is an expansion. 53 is a slight expansion uh, over the prior month of 52.7. Saying there's improvement in the manufacturing sector in Japan, but it's from deeply negative levels, so they're still way behind. How about China, the biggest exporting nation? Now, if you, it's all this demand from the U.S., right, and you would expect a big increase in the manufacturing sector in China because we import a lot of stuff. If you, if you saw the trade uh, deficit from last month, I think we covered this week, that it's record highs. So you would see the manufacturing PMI should be high. And instead it went from 51.9 to 51.1, meaning barely expansionary over the, in fact, it's starting to slow because the number's smaller. Not what you're expecting to see. The services sector in China slowed from 56.3 to 54.9. So it's still expanding at a slow rate. Momentum is being lost here. That's what you want to understand. This is not what you expect if the global economy is indeed going to boom like we're all being told it is. How about we move on to France? Take a little visit to France. CBI, preliminary, 1.1 to 1.3. Not a big increase there. Perhaps slowing trend there. Uh, let's move on to, uh, we've got Italy, CPI. I thought we were just in, oh, France, Italy, CPI, uh, 0 0.8 to 1.1. That's a bit of an increase at 0 0.4 or 2, 3. Jeez, wow, way off there. Uh, but anyways, still, I'm, I'm curious if these are slowing down. I guess we'll have to wait till next month to find out. But I have a hunch we're seeing this slow down. How about the broad Eurozone, 1.3 to 1.6 on the CPI. So again, nowhere near the U.S.'s number. And if, if you subtract a base effect out of that, I don't know if it's 1%. You're really not seeing the, the big rise in consumer prices that everyone's been betting big on. How about the we move into the data for today for the U.S. Rate about personal consumption expenditures. This is a Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. Came in on March at 2.3% year over year. Take off one for your base effect at one3 why Powell's not worried about this. Excluding food and energy, the core PC is at 1.8. Assuming the same base effect, perhaps, you're under 1%. Again, you wonder why Powell's not worried. Here's another reason. Personal incomes in March skyrocketed 21.1% thanks to government transfers. But look at personal spending, 4.2. What is that telling you? you know, if you're looking at the data, what does this mean? Consumers are not spending. They're saving. They're saving their money. They're worried about the economy. Look at real personal consumption. Real means inflation adjusted 3.6%. So people are saving their concern. This is not what you would expect if there's real inflation. If there's all this inflation coming, people would take all this personal income and unload it before prices go way up. So consumers are worried about the economy. You don't get inflation when spending is not following incomes. And we know incomes are gonna go down uh, in, in probably by, let's see, next in May, because the stimulus checks are about 85% done or thereabouts right now. Uh, how about the Chicago PMI printed a whopping 72.1 prices paid, highest level since December of 1983. What does that tell you? It's a peak, 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 peak in prices paid. And when prices paid peak, what happens to interest rates? They start to go down and there you get your disinflationary trend. How about the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey? Current conditions unchanged over March. Consumer sentiment though and expectations up a little bit as consumers are a little bit more optimistic. Do you think they'd be a lot more optimistic or under current conditions because of stimulus checks? Apparently not so much. Five-year inflation expectations unchanged, but inflation expectations went from 3.7 to 3.4. So consumers not seeing as much inflation as everyone's telling them they should see. Let's move on to the H.8. We got assets and liabilities of all commercial banks. Bank credit down six billion securities and bank credit up 14, mortgage-backed securities up four, and U.S. Treasuries up a little bit, seven billion. So banks back buying a little bit of bonds, not so much last week. How about loans and leases at all commercial banks down 19 billion, commercial industrial loans down uh, 19, real estate down 16, consumer loans down here up four, hey, a little bright spot in the consumer lending, cash is down 40 billion. Let's take a look at the PowerPoints and that's not where they are, here they are. And what do we have on the PowerPoints? Real estate loan growth down minus 1.9% from a year ago. I want you to look at this. You see real estate loan growth decelerating through most of 2020, now into 2021, contracting. And what happened to mortgage rates? Falling, right? Falling, falling, falling. Finally, they rose. And what happened? Mortgage lending went up a little bit and then boom, back and down and into contraction and tells you rates too high. So if you didn't refi, 
you get another chance at some point. For those who did, maybe you get a chance at a lower rate. How about commercial industrial loans? Down at one, minus 14% from a year ago. The only good news here is that the three-month rate of change is virtually flat and unchanged from the prior week, suggesting that as we work through the base effects that this may be uh, hopefully done in terms of the credit contraction, but I have a hunch that that will be short-lived. How about loans and leases? All commercial banks. Growth rate is running minus 4.5% from a year ago. Six-month rate of change minus 1. Three-month rate of change minus a quarter percent. All are falling from the prior week. And consumer loans, here's your bright spot. Credit card growth rate up to minus 5.2% from a year ago, uh, courtesy of stimulus. But imagine once that passes through, uh, we will see that that will probably trend down as, again, consumers, you know, if you pay this off. Now, why would they do that? If there's inflation, right, and your wages, your maybe your Social Security, your pension, you know, employment, unemployment is not going to keep up with inflation, how do you solve that problem, right? You, you, you reduce your debt. You, you put money in savings for the stuff you don't know you can afford. So anyways, thanks for being fans as always. And for those of you who alerted me to the fact the first version didn't have audio, I appreciate that. And we will see you on Sunday for the uh, chart show and back on Monday for the macro show. I'm Steve Van Meter. Have a great weekend. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only is not intended to provide investment or advice. It is not to be construed as recommendation or solicitation by our social security, financial insurance, or to participate in particular training strategies. Video was paired by Steve Van Meter. Personal capacity opinions expressed in the video that do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steve Van Meter Financial.